Hello, and welcome to the March episode of the Organic Gardening Podcast. Fiona's taking a break this month, so I'll be joined by Emma O'Neill, head gardener at Garden Organic. This month, we'll be discussing the joys of spring. It's a busy time for any grower, but one full of hope and promise for the year to come. And I personally cannot wait. Later, I'll be chatting to Richard Wilford, Head of Garden Design and Collection Support at the Royal Botanic Gardens queue. And finally, Emma, Anton and I will be answering your springtime organic gardening questions, including a challenge with foxes digging up lawns, the best way to compost weeds, and the best things to grow in a shallow soil. Now, I'm off to join Emma in the virtual potting shed. Now, many listeners might not have heard of you before. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background and your role at Garden Organic. I'm Emma and I'm the head gardener at Garden Organic and I manage all things in the demonstration garden as well as doing some articles and this occasionally. <laughs> this is uh, We're coming up to the busiest time, aren't we, really, for gardeners. What's yeah. your plan for the garden at the moment? Oh, my God. What aren't we doing, to be <laughs> honest? Obviously, we're doing quite a lot of cutting back now at the moment because being organic, we leave literally as much stuff on as possible, all the old seed heads, all the old stems, um, as soon as all the new shoots start to come about. That, of course, creates quite a lot of compost. So we will be hot on our compost turning to try and keep that decomposing as quick as possible. How long will you sort of turn your compost? What's your recommendation for that? Well, we try and do ours at least once a month, but if possible, I try and do it twice a month because we're trying to maintain a hot system. And so, as you know, the more you can turn it, the quicker it's going to decompose and the better you keep the heat in. We also have to chop everything up quite small and make sure we're getting the right balance um, in the heap. So one of the great things about now is the mowing as well. So we can add grass clippings to the compost, which really helps speed that up. What yeah. about irrigation? Will you give it anything, Any uh, keep it moist if we go for it? It's been quite dry in London. I don't know what it's been like in Coventry, but it's been quite dry here. It depends. I found, to be fair, last year, at one of our issues was by the end of the season, it was too wet. So considering it had all that dry period, right at the bottom, it was very wet. We will see as we go. I tend to have a look, you know, if I can see right, the, it's really quite dry, we'd chuck a couple of cans on it. But, but uh, with caution, it, that's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. yeah, and we keep it open so we don't tend to cover ours over so that it's constantly exposed to the elements, really. And of course, as well as composting, this is the big time for seed sowing. What plans have you got for that? Oh, yeah, well, there's stacks and stacks of stuff in the veg garden, obviously, that we'll be sowing. That will be well underway. We've obviously already done things like aubergines and chilies earlier on, but uh, we'll be doing all the salady stuff. Hopefully, if the soil is warm enough, we'll start doing the direct sowing, the carrots and the parsnips. It'll be successional sowing now. So from March, we're kind of sowing something probably every week, you know, even every couple of days sometimes in some cases. So do you have a plan for it? I like to. I call it three waves, I suppose I'd call it, where I sort of look now and I'd sow my sort of tender stuff like aubergine, chilies, the slow growing stuff in propagators now. And then I'll start drill sowing, as you just described, some root crops, salads, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'll probably go next wave brassica and then the final wave of my beans and the sort of tender stuff again. Do you kind of plan it out like that? Because obviously you've got a bigger space than I have to deal with. So you need to keep that garden. It's a demonstration garden. You need to keep it full. So how much time does it take up for you to continue to keep doing that? What I tend to do is I have an annual plan for the whole garden generally, you know, right from when we would do our rose pruning to our hedge cutting to our mulching. So I've I've planned something for every month and that's the same with the seed sowing. So I tend to have a look and think, right, what's the optimum time to sow that? How much do we need? And then for each month, we'll check the list, check the seed box. Invariably, I've always missed something that should have been sown at some time and have to <laughs> have to try and catch up. And then I'll see what I think has done successfully. And obviously, as you say, we want the beds to be full for the majority of the time. Hence why we do quite a lot of successional sowing. 
so that any quick growing crops that we then harvest, we've got another load that can go straight in. And as it warms up, we don't we do more direct sowing as well at that time. By direct sowing, you mean drill drill sowing, get them in straight into the yeah. ground. Yeah. So that's a good plan for any listener now. That's a good plan to actually write it down to plan it like that. I do the same sort of thing. I like to have some sort of program in my head because otherwise you can just sow a bit here and so it's easy to get carried away and have no structure and end up with a load of stuff you don't need or not have enough of something you don't need. So to yeah. actually write it down is important yeah very much so because i've found before as well i've got caught out where i thought oh we'll get ahead of the game or so nearly everything and of course for one it's quite foolish because you'll end up with things that then get leggy if you go too early Mm. you know and other times then you've got you haven't got the room then all the time to prick stuff out then harden it off then get it in the ground so you need to have some sort of timetable so you know that you've got the time and the energy to get it all done at the right time and to give them the optimum sort of start, really. Yeah, I would suggest that um, having a plan like that is a very good idea. But also I think that people tend to associate organic garden just with food growing, but we do a lot more than that, don't we? We do a lot more than that. You're a big fan of uh, of flowers, aren't you? You love your flowers. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to grow in the garden this year. Obviously, I'm very lucky in that I've got a whole ornamental section, so that's got lots of permanent planting in so lots of herbaceous perennials in there um and again that was that was quite carefully planned so that we would have things from spring right through to the autumn so that there was always something of interest so that's from bulbs trees shrubs all that sort of thing but then we also grow stuff as fillers so we'll have things like cosmos snapdragons allison we always bring out our dahlias sort of around March, April, depending on where we are with frosts, canners, all of those things go into bulk up the garden. And I think it's really important to note that organic isn't just, as you say, about food production. You can do your ornamentals. In fact, I personally think easier because often those plants stand. So you don't need to do as much with it. You just need to make sure that the soil in the first place is organic that you've sourced the plant, preferably organically. And also, of course, you can propagate from them. You constantly got a stock of plants already. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's true. Uh, organic methods apply to all plants, don't they? And I love this yeah. idea as well. I, I'm, you know, my limited space on my balcony, for instance, I'm a potager. I like to get the flower and the veg in mixed together. Mm. I love that kind of, you know, my hanging baskets have tomatoes and They'll have a, a bedding plant, a geranium in them as well. I love that combination. And I tend to think that is you're using all your space then, aren't you? You're using all the available space and that cuts down your weeding, cuts down your watering. Be, and also then you're encouraging biodiversity, wildlife, etc. So putting it all in the mix is what we're saying, isn't it? It's key, really, isn't it? Especially in organics, you need a lot of stuff in your armoury. And I think so. Why, whilst we don't actually talk about so much as companion planting because there's not that much science around it, I definitely believe believe the more diversity you've got in your garden the more beneficial stuff you're going to get in the more pollinators you're covering the grounds you're protecting the soil you're suppressing the weeds so it's a win-win for me so we have flowers herbs fruit veg everywhere we try to have something of, of it all over the place and no space then gets left. Yeah, well, so, I mean, you do a good job. I recommend going to see it if you can to the to our general listeners out there. It looked really good last summer. I'm sure it will again this summer. If you were moving into a, a new house and you had a bit of a garden and it was a you know a clean slate, so to speak, what would be your favourite herbaceous plants? The ones that would give you the most value. But what what would you put in? Well, I love all of the cone flowers. So I love all the things like the echinaceas, the heleniums, the rudbeckias. Um, I do tend to think echinacea can be a bit hit and miss the purpurea is excellent you can't you can't do any better but they've bred so many now i don't think that all of them are as hardy as they make out and they really do not like the wet but rudbeckia for my money the goldstone i mean that Mm. just keeps going and going and going heleniums i love because they provide the height and the bees absolutely love them but then I, i wouldn't be without hardy geraniums i think that yeah you can't beat that i mean as ground cover flowering most of the summer 
you can do the Chelsea chop with most of them and then they come back again. So what's not to love? Yeah, that sounds great. A lot of colour there, definitely. And I can hear what you're saying about actually quite a lot of the basis plants, they've been bred so heavily now that they're almost, mm-hmm. you grow them as bedding plants. They're not even seen as perennials. So my yeah. advice was is to go for species plants, you know, ones that originate, ones that they're bred from, because they'll give you the best quality yeah. and you get these long flowering periods. But it's not just the um, writing they're going to keep you busy with, uh, is it, this year? Just to make your life even busier, Emma, you've also, you're doing another garden at the end see gardeners world live going to tell us a little bit about that yeah so the theme this year there is heavily about biodiversity really but about what you can do in your own back garden so we've incorporated things like ponds weeds which really we shouldn't just class as weeds so things that are beneficial you know we were talking about biodiversity earlier so things like dandelions are one of the early sources of pollens for bees So it's about trying to re-educate people about those things as well. Um, Also, we're going to try this year with perennial veg because that's become more and more popular now. We've got a bigger area of that this time in the demonstration garden as well. So it's a good time to try and show that what else you can do to extend your, uh, your productive season. And for those people that find veg growing well, as you know, with your allotment, it can be really intense, can't it? Take up a lot of time. Mm. So if you grow perennial veg, that sort of limits some of that time for you, really. So we're doing that and um, a dry garden after last year with, such, you know, that terrible, well, it wasn't terrible for me. I love the sun, but <laughs> we mm. had no water, did we? And so we have going have a small sort of dry garden there and, hopefully investigate more in the demonstration garden as well as about plants that will tolerate different climate changes. So not just dry, but, you know, if we suddenly have a deluge, we're trying to investigate things that will stand better, really. Yeah, you're never quite sure what we're going to get with the British weather, are you? You just don't know. But so that's really good. That's what a show garden is, really. It's uh, ideas. It's given lots of little ideas for the public to take in. And it sounds like it's going to be very interesting. I can't wait to see it. You've also got your hands full, though, Chris. You're always busy. What with the allotment and the balcony? What are your plans this year? Well, it's like uh, I said earlier, isn't it? Uh, I think this is the time of year where your private life and your professional life just fuse together because I will be eating and sleeping and dreaming gardening for the next couple of months. But I'm quite excited about the, the allotment because I completely re-landscaped it over the winter. You know, I've, I've put all the new paths, put new paths in anything. So I've got a really blank slate there. So the drill sowing will start soon. The potatoes are chitting. I've got lots of onions. I've got some good garlic on the go. So I'm just going to gradually start filling it up. But like you, the sowing will go on all through the summer. I'll complete, com- completely uh, repeat stuff. I love all my salad crops. I call it my salad bar. I've got a big section yeah. I'll use for a salad bar. Um, so it's all go. And then the propagators are all getting washed down, cleaned out. My aubergines will go in. My chilies will go in. I had a brilliant year for chilies last year because it was so hot. But who knows yeah, what we'll course. get this year. Yeah. So I'm still using them now. <laughs> They're great. I've got a big jar of dried chilies and I'll still use them in the cooking now. The balcony, I'm going to let this bulb time. So I had my first crocuses come out. Um, and I've also got some uh, grape ice since that are flowering. They're just coming out as well, and some daffs. So that's all going to start flowering away, and I'm really excited about that because it just lifts your spirit to go out mm. out of the doors and see it starting to flower. But also, I've gone thinking about what I'll replace it with as I spin it. Um, as it comes to the end of the spring, I'll start putting in the colour. Obviously, I like my bedding. There'll be some bedding in there, and I have my quick crops on there as well. So, yeah, it's all, to me, it's all about the seed sowing now. That's all it is. I'll live and breathe and think seeds ever, and uh, I can't, I'll be lying <laughs> if I said I wasn't excited. No, it's a great time of year, isn't it? And thank you, Emma. Thanks for joining in today, telling us all about uh, what you're, you're going to be welcome. up to and writing the show garden, uh, and I'll catch up with you soon. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, take care, Chris. Earlier this year, I had the pleasure of meeting up with Richard Wilford. Richard is the Head of Garden Design and Collection Support at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q. And we used to work together many moons ago, so I look forward to catching up with him and talking all things alpines and climate change. 
I have the honour and the pleasure of being with Richard Wilford today, who's at Q Botanic Gardens. Uh, tell me your job description again. Hi, so I am currently manager of garden design, but I've been at Q for a long time, I'm scared to admit. <laughs> 34 years. I started with alpines. I started working alpines and bulbs and rock gardening, but I then moved on to more general, general plants, herbaceous, all outside stuff. How come you got an interest in them? What kicked you off with it? Part of the draw of alpines for me is where they grow in the wild. I love mountains. I love that mountain scenery and the idea of little plants that grow up in these higher mountains. I just find that fascinating and how they survive in those yeah. conditions. So that's that's what where my interest came from. And then looking after the collections here at Kew, you just kind of when you work at the Alpine Nursery, you're really focusing on individual plants and you're picking them over and making sure they're neat and ready for display. And you kind of really get into the details of each plant and what they look like and when they grow and when they flower and are they looking sick or are they healthy and that all kind of get obsessed yeah. by it. So I can understand why people get a bit <laughs> yeah. obsessed by them. But um, so that's that's where it started really. And so I suppose in a way they're incredibly specialist plants, aren't they? Because they, 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 they grow in such harsh conditions. Yeah. That accounts for them, what the, the size of them and how they grow. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are very specialist. Some of them are, are actually quite commonly growing. People probably get alpines without even realising. Things like crocus grow in mountain areas, but you get them in my lawn here. They're yeah. alpine plants. Semper vivums, the house leeks. They're alpines, but people grow them a lot. But some of them are very particular about the conditions they grow in. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, they, they're, they're used to growing high up in a mountain all winter. They're frozen, covered in snow. They go completely dormant, grow them at sea level. And you have days where it's kind of one day it's 10 degrees, next day it's minus three. Then it's next day it's 12 degrees and they just they never go into dormancy. So they try and grow and there's not much light. So they get elongated, they get mouldy, you know, all sorts of things. So that's why we have to grow them in, in particular conditions to try and offset that. So really, I mean, they're hardcore plants, aren't they? A lot of them. They're they tough. Yeah, 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 they're tough old things. You know, they huddle close to the ground. A lot of them are kind of dome shaped or mat shaped. They they grow very close to the ground, so they don't expose themselves to the harsh weather too much. No, but they they just they can survive really extreme conditions. It's it's when we do nice to them that they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. So it's a keep mean treat and keep yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, but also, I suppose in a way, they um that that because that speciality, then the way you treat them if you're growing them like you are here in hops or out in the yeah. ground, they must be quite sensitive to chemical use and that kind of thing. You, you must use a lot of natural methods to grow them. To we do successful. and for quite a long time here at Kew we've been using integrated pest management and we focus a lot more on biological control. When I first started you know 30 odd years ago we, we sprayed every month um, for different you know for green fly, for white fly, for red spider mite but now it's nearly all done by biological control and we only spray when we really have to and there's very little spraying goes on here at Kew these days. Some things have to be done because it's you know it's part of the national collection of plants we've got to look after them but try and reduce it as much as we can. So it's been phased out really. Though, it is it? really yeah, you yeah. know it's just it's apart from it being not good for the environment it's not good for the people spraying it it's expensive you have to have, to have loads of you know equipment to do yeah. it you know it's not an easy thing to do anyway so. and I think also the big thing I think for uh, organic gardeners are thinking is, is how it damages the ecology of the soil isn't absolutely, it absolutely yeah. and I expect yeah. now alpines have a particular need when it comes to soil so they're quite sensitive to that yeah I mean they're particularly sensitive to anything that's that's not free draining um, and some of them are quite particular about the acidity of the soil you get acid loving species so yeah because they grow so in in so little soil if it's not right then it can affect them quite badly <laughs> yeah. you know. it's no heavy clay I <laughs> no 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 exactly they're going to have nice free draining soil yeah. Yeah. which is why we have a rock garden you know it kind of raises them above the ground so they get that drainage yeah I should say we're just in the ecological right of next to the rock garden which is looking amazing when I was here 20 odd years ago time flies isn't yeah. it um, that, it was, it's grown in a lot it was quite a lot of it was new then wasn't it yeah we, had, we had a when I was working there we did must have been seven eight years of every year clearing a whole area putting new soil in and rearranging the rocks that have collapsed over the years and so yeah it was it was a period when it was all quite newly planted but now it's really grown into itself yeah but it looks really good so you, you mentioned biological controls what, what yeah. examples of that have you got well there's a parasitic wasp that attacks green fly for example so it works well in a glass house so in an alpine house environment it's fine obviously don't work that well outside because they just fly away <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you've got a more enclosed environment you can introduce these um, these um, biological controls that will attack the pest and that, um, and that keeps the numbers and down. it keeps the numbers down and I think another thing that's changed is tolerance of having some aphids you just go accept the fact you're going to get some aphids sometimes yeah. and then you control it you don't kind of see an aphid and immediately get your sprayer out and spray it well it's interesting you were saying about 30 years ago same with me when we started it was all about control and it was you know you were right on top of it whereas you think we as gardeners even in big plant plant plants we become a little bit freer with it a little bit looser with it realising that it's wheels within wheels isn't it when it comes to nature exactly and it's all you kind of got to get the whole ecosystem to settle down and, and work naturally 
and do what it should do. It's the same. I mean, we're looking, sitting here, looking at our new kitchen garden, which is a no-dig garden. Yeah. And, and that's all about preserving the soil, not digging it up every year and, and destroying the, the habitat, but actually preserving the soil and actually it does a much better job of controlling weeds and, and, and the health of the plants is so much better with you don't, not disturbing the soil. And I think the soil is the, the most important thing for a whole range of reasons. I mean, it's great it's carbon sink soil. That's another reason for not disturbing it. It's the things that live in the soil lock in a lot of the carbon in the atmosphere that comes out of the atmosphere. And, and if you're disturbing the soil every, every year, you're, letting, you're releasing that carbon dioxide back into the air. So you're causing problems on a, on a much bigger yeah. scale, aren't you? That's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because we're finding out more and more about soil science, aren't we? Oh, Times definitely, going, yeah. Obviously, the things like the no dig really, yeah. you, it kind of brings that proof, doesn't it? it oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you can tell, you know, over the years, the health of our kitchen garden, because it, although it's newly landscaped, it's been here quite a few years, the plants are really healthy without digging the soil every year. Yeah. You didn't need it. You just mulch it every year. Put a nice layer of mulch on that rots down. The goodness goes into the soil. You don't need to dig it. And all, all the life in the soil in that, it becomes balanced, doesn't it? You get it fungus. balances out. Yeah, exactly. that, yeah, yeah. All yeah. the fungal interactions. Yeah. And, and things end up controlling themselves. You yeah. don't need to worry about pest outbreaks because it's all naturally controlled. I was going to say also, I mean, one thing about alpines that appeals to me is I, um, I have an allotment, but also I, have, I live on a, in a the floors up. So I have a balcony. It's my yeah. pride and joy. Yeah. So I love it. Yeah. I, and I, I very much use it for seasonal stuff and grow crops on it. Yeah. And eat off it. I like a lot of bedding. I'm very cotton. My parks days kind of get to yeah. it. But it would be brilliant for growing alpines because of the, obviously the scale yeah. the scale of them. Are they easy to propagate or are they easy? Yeah, some of them are very easy. Um, you, know, you can take cuttings quite simply. A lot of things will root quite easily. Things like saxifrages can, can be rooted quite easily. And they're like you say, they're small. They're small plants. They're not going to take over your balcony. You can do a, uh, quite a big range of plants in a small area. And they'll love being high up and having that exposure they don't want it to be too hot um, so yeah it's a perfect place to do it really just got, as long as you've got free draining soil that's the key that's good. So, so maybe if I got a big terracotta pot like a bowl or much, yeah. I could do a little alpine garden absolutely you could put some nice gritty soil in and then um, a, a kind of mulch of grit on top to keep the moisture away from the leaves you can grow a whole load of things in there you know yeah you could see and that's interesting so as long as it's so, so a bit of horticultural grit and soil what kind of percentages would you mix them at we normally do about a third by volume grit to a loam based compost right so that's the kind of general standard mix. standard alpine mix ah. you've got things that are particularly sensitive you might do 50 50 grit yeah. and soil but it's mostly a third, third mostly point. a third that's a good tip and then you say as well you once it's planted you put your plants in you then mulch around them with the gravel and that's the gravel yeah, yeah it just keeps their leaves away from wet soils because they yeah. will get rained on in the winter when they're not used to it so to keep that water away from the crown the plant the, you know it's beneficial yeah. to have a nice thick mulch of grit on top so you could I, I'm, I'm, this, I'm picturing this now so I've got <laughs> <laughs> I've got my bowl or I could have a sink like you've got, you've got yeah sink that's a kind here. of traditional yeah. way of doing it yeah, these old, so, old stone look, sinks yeah. they look so beautiful yeah. they really do so I've got that and maybe I'll put some saxy fried in I might put I might go for the easy option put some semper viva in yeah. Yeah. so, so what about bulbs and stuff it's quite a lot of bulbs alpine bulbs yeah well as I've mentioned crocus um, snowdrops um, winter aconite aranthus they're all kind of they're, that kind of they're small they flower in winter or early spring um, yeah it's a, a range of bulbs you could add as well and they kind of pop up and flower and disappear which is so I pop them in in the autumn, put them in the autumn. the autumn, and then yeah. they, they'll come through for the fur and winter come spring. For, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quite a simple thing to be able to do. Then yeah, it? it's very easy. And um, like I say, if you've got restricted space, it's kind of the perfect plants, really. Do you have any sort of big favourites when it comes to alpines at all? Well, I've mentioned saxifragas. I do like some of those. You get a group, the silver saxifragas, which are kind of grey leaves and they've got little white edges to the leaves, which is actually lime. They secrete lime oh. around the edge of the leaves, so it's like they're etched in this white line, which makes them really attractive these rosettes of leaves and then they have these big sprays of white flowers in the spring so, so they're really interesting favorites. so yeah. lime they secrete lime that's yeah so they, in... gr- they grow in limestone areas so chalky conditions yeah, yeah yeah so they kind of absorb that through when they're taking the water up and then they secrete it because they don't need it they secrete it out in the leaves it also helps reflect intense sunlight so it's kind of a double advantage for that that's what the gray the silver of the leaf does yeah it? yeah so you know, imagine high, high up in the mountain, the summers might be short, but they're often very sunny and that sunlight is very intense. So they, a lot of really high alpines have kind of silvery or grey leaves that help reflect some of that light. A bit like Mediterranean plants do as well. You get a lot of grey leaf Mediterranean plants for the same reason. They're reflecting yeah. the heat of the sun. So this, right, yeah, yeah, so that makes perfect sense. It's a good way, isn't it, to be able to tell if you were uh, uh, looking at plants in even a garden centre or something or thinking of buying them. Then you can get tips, can't you, hints of what those conditions those plants By looking at growing. the plants, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Somebody get... Uh, Plants with hairy leaves often have the same reason. The hairs actually shade the leaves a bit and reflect the light. So, yeah. you know, they're good plants for hot, dry conditions. You know? It's clever, isn't it? They're very clever. Right? Yeah. And I think that, as I was going to say, I mean, obviously Q has got the, was it the biggest 
collection of plants in the world, isn't it? It's sort of collected plants and put here. And, and yeah. I think originally uh, got, but the botanic gardens were uh, almost like libraries, living collections, I would say. Yeah, the way things were set out, you know, often in their families and, and very quite rigid. Yeah. So now that moves me on to the uh, the part of the job um, you do, which is, it sounds very like, quite important and quite <laughs> a lot of responsibility, which is the garden design, the design of the garden. And yeah. I think this is also about um, reflecting conservation, but there's also economic reasons for that as well, is there? Yeah, so the first big project I worked on was the Great Broadwalk Borders, which one of the reasons is Kew didn't have a big herbaceous border, like most gardens have herbaceous borders, Kew didn't have one. We grew the plants, but in different places. So I wanted to do a big herbaceous border, put it in the kind of busiest path in Kew, and it's the longest, we think, the longest herbace- double herbaceous borders in the world, you know, 320 metres on each side, um, and it brings people in. People love it, yeah. and that's, you know, that's part of the job, is to get come to Kew, give them something to, to, to visit, and they'll, hopefully they'll learn a few things as well while they're here. You it know. does look incredible. I, I, I come quite often in the summer, it looks amazing. And that, and that obviously, but well, that's also quite for pollinators and stuff like that. It seemed yeah. quite alive when I was in here, when, with, um, with bees and butterflies. Yeah, before we started it, it was, it was just lawn, and you put the plants in, and you suddenly there's insects everywhere. You mm. just realise, you just put these plants in, and suddenly the biodiversity comes. You know, you don't have to attract it, it's just there, because you put all these plants in. So it makes a huge difference. So you create the right conditions for it, and they, yeah, they come. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we don't dig the broad walk either. That's another no dig border. You know, that's we just mulch it every year. So right, yeah. and away you go. Yeah. So there's no dig. It's not just a kitchen garden, but across the whole site, really. Yeah, it's very sure. Much, we used to only remember the old. We're in the evolution garden now, which is a systematic garden. Talk about plant families and evolution and how plants have developed and what they're related to and all that stuff. Before it used to be called the order beds, which was a load of rectangular beds, each one with its own plant family in, and they used to double dig them. Before I started, they used to double dig them every winter, yeah. and then they kind of went to single digging when I was here. And then now don't do that at all. It's just it's all changing because no I remember the order. I remember being at Edinburgh Botanics and they were having a session beds. You know, yeah. it was everything like this is you know a, a, a betulacy. This is and it was all done by family and it was yeah. regimented and it yeah. Was, yeah. just like a library really. But yeah. that's really changed, doesn't it? Because yeah. they, you're going for a much more uh, natural. Look. So you've been involved in was it ecology? We're saying um, evolution. Evolution. Garden, that's it. That's the word I was yeah. looking for. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. So the evolution garden. Yeah, it's about plant relationships. But talking about um, adapting to climate as well is important. But we we are currently looking at what we're calling a landscape succession policy, what we're going to grow that will survive a future climate. So instead of grouping things according to what family they're in, we're going to group things according to what irrigation they need, so that plants that don't need a lot of irrigation can all be grouped together. So it's almost like habitat gardening rather than planting things in fam- rigid families. You know? So you'll have an arid area for, for yeah. and then you'll have an area for bog plants and wetter plants. Yeah, so things that need that moisture, we'll group them so yeah. we just water that bit. We don't have to water the whole garden because because things are according to their families rather than the conditions they need. So it makes, from a, from a horticultural husbandry point of view, it makes perfect sense as well. Oh, of course it does, yeah. It's a lot better. It's a lot of saving water. It's a lot easier to manage. And actually, probably more interesting for the general visitor to have a look at, see a nice mixed planting rather than something that's all, you know, a big group of chillers, you know. So you get, so yeah, exactly. So you also you get um, ideas for your own garden from well, that as absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. You know, people have all different conditions in their gardens. They can come and find. You know, if they've got a hot, sunny garden, they can see plants that grow in those conditions. If they've got a really damp garden, they can go and see plants that grow in those conditions. You know, yeah, it's brilliant. It's yeah. really useful. And you have know. a lot of interpretation. But I walked around just now, and I was uh, there's a, a, an English show called Quercus Robot up there with a bracket fungus on it. And there's oh, a yeah. brilliant interpretation board in front of it. There's a lot of that going on at Q as well, isn't there? Yeah. So, so people can learn here. Yeah, and I think the last few years that's really changed that we're getting much more um, instant interpretation if something looks good or something worth pointing out then we can just a small panel put it out there explain what it is take it away when it's gone um, so yeah there's lots of information around a whole site and they're still working their way through the different collections and different areas um, just to inform people not just about what they're looking at but the kind of conservation issues things that are rare habitats that are being lost that all these kind of stories can be woven into the interpretation and uh, obviously Q do lot do conservation work all over the globe don't yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. They yeah. really, you know, there's a lot. I think the lot. It's amazing, really, with botanic gardens how little people know about them, considering the incredible work they do. Yeah. I always think we, we're undersold, aren't we? It's part of your job trying to reflect that as well. Yeah. So you know, Q is primarily a scientific institution, which a lot of people don't realise. There's more scientists work here than, than gardeners. Um, so we're trying to reflect that in the in the gardens to show not just beauty but interesting stories. And evolution gardens, a good example of that. A lot of the work that was done on plant relationships, looking at their DNA, was done at Q and. Um, 
um, there was an international group of people, but Q was a major part of that. So it's important to show that when people are walking around. You know. And that that's also looking at biodiversity globally, isn't it? And how you protect that. Biodiversity is hugely important, and that's yes, yeah, a big thing now. You know, biodiversity and climate change is linked. You know, bi- a nice biodiverse, balanced ecosystem is much better for climate change than than a kind of artificial environment. So by, by undermining biodiversity, we're un- we're we're, in- we're we're aiding climate change. In Absolutely, way. yeah, because there's the balance of climate change is off. You know, we're, we're emitting a lot more carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels, and we're destroying habitats that would have, would have absorbed that carbon dioxide out in the atmosphere. So you destroy, destroy a rainforest, that's a huge carbon sink. It would absorb huge amounts of carbon, but if we get rid of it, that's gone. So we're, we're doing two things. Yeah. So we need to address that balance, reduce the emissions, but also um, maximise the carbon sequestration, it's called, you know, the carbon being taken into the, the ecosystem. It's another reason why we stopped digging up peat as well, isn't it? That whole oh, carbon God, yeah. balance yeah. and the fact that... Peat's a huge sort of, uh, sink for carbon. It's a huge store for carbon. Yeah. And digging it up, yeah, releasing all that carbon back in the atmosphere. So protecting our natural habitats is important. And if you were reflecting that, obviously you say it's science, but the living collections are a big um, sign of that. So what, so what yeah. big stuff have you got in the pipeline? I'm curious to know what you'd be doing as the, as the sort of design guy behind it all. There's a few things. Um, well, one thing is we're extending the boardwalk, so we're going to make it even longer. <laughs> That's, the, <laughs> yeah. that's this spring um, but we're going to focus on drought tolerant plants for all the reasons I've said you know being careful with water I'm also doing plans for what's going to be a carbon garden uh-huh. which is why we keep going on about climate change so <laughs> yeah. it's on my mind yeah. um, but this is a garden that will ex- explain to visitors the whole story of carbon where it is now where it's stored now what we're doing to release it into the atmosphere that we need to stop doing what this could mean for the future how we can use plants to offset the effects of climate change and also to slow climate change down so it's a very big and complicated subject I've got to distill down into a garden so that's what I'm working on at the moment <laughs> yes, no, so, <laughs> no pressure no, no sweat <laughs> <laughs> that, that millions uh, of people will come to look at right. yeah. so I want, it to make, I want it to look nice but also I wanted to get the message across that we've got to stop doing these things you know? and, and I suppose in a way we use examples of plants that can absorb carbon or and, and yeah. soils will obviously be a part of this soil right? is a huge part of it so we're going to have a kind of artificial soil profile that shows all the things that go on in the soil how important that is for using plants plants that um, cope with a warmer climate, how to use trees. There's an interesting fact, I thought, last summer when we had 40 degrees on Kew Green, it was 27 degrees in the Arboretum in the conservation area. Wow. That's a massive difference and that's purely because it's, you're amongst trees. So you can use trees to cool buildings, you can cool in parks, you know, people shade under trees, we get rid of those, we're losing all that. And even, even street trees, I mean, in a way, we talk about a lot about tree plants, but it's not nowhere near enough in our streets, and that, because that not, they also absorb all the, yeah. all the dust and they <laughs> Amazing yeah. for pollution, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, so that's so that temperature change. I mean, I knew it would be there, but that's quite drastic. That's quite a, that's thirteen yeah. degrees difference. That's from unbearable to actually not too bad. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, remember, I remember coming here last summer when it was really hot, and uh, I said to my wife, "Let's go over a picnic," you know. Yeah. And, uh, and we were just sitting there. Oh, I like the sun, but yeah. we were in the shade. You know, <laughs> everybody was in the yeah. shade, kind of leaping from one tree yeah, to the next. Exactly. Because yeah. it was that hot, and it's, yeah. that's really interesting yeah, fact. Yeah. So the carbon. What? How do you? I'm interested in how you go about the carbon guns. You you think about it, obviously, like. Uh, and then you sit down and you do a design. Will you be on the pen for it? Or? Yeah, so we start off by having a bit of a work group with some science people and, and interpretation. And we kind of grouped, got as many different stories together as we could think of. And then we grouped them into themes. And then we you know, ended up with four main themes. And that's what the garden's based on. It's kind of four areas. And I need to put planting that will reflect those themes. So the first one is where is carbon? You know, where is it now? In the soil, in the air, in, in living things. Second theme is about climate change. Third theme is called nature-based solutions which is using plants and habitats to offset climate change and then the fourth one is what you can do so it kind of brings it down to the visitor level what you can do in your own life in yeah. your own garden um, to help you know offset climate change combat climate change that's brilliant because I suppose in a way it is that I suppose people get frustrated that you know you feel just like you know irrelevant because it's such a hard thing but if we all look, say took our, my balcony or a small little postage garden yeah. across the nation across the world and, and, and applied those rules all those organic rules and um, climate friendly rules into those spaces then we'll it would difference. make a difference every little bit helps and and everyone's got to be involved in that and if you get people enthused about doing that they'll start looking at how their carbon emissions as well and maybe try and reduce those um, because it's not I mean I know at the moment there's a, a cost of living crisis people are reducing their heating and trying to cut back but it 
But in the long term, it's, it's, it's more about climate change. And we've got yeah. to keep doing that, even if the situation change, economic situation changes. We've still got to reduce our carbon emissions. So, so you were very focused then, by the sound of it, on climate change, on those, on the issues that that's causing. Yeah, it. Obviously, definitely. With the conservation work, you're out on the ground, aren't you? So you're seeing it in real time. I think a lot of it tends to happen in other countries, other places, and it doesn't relate to people's lives where it's extreme. Yeah, exactly. And it, and people become, you know, they don't have that connection. They don't. They might think about it when they're here, but then then they'll forget about it. But if you bring it down to their own personal lives, and yeah. they can start making a little bit of a difference. Then it becomes relevant to it them. It becomes really. relevant to them, yeah, what they do. now. If, you know, And they'll probably have a better garden because of it, because it's a bit more, yeah. as we've talked before, it's more of a balanced ecosystem. And things will, you know, pests won't take over. You'll have a nice mixture of, of, of living things. And, and, you know, you get a biodiverse garden. It could be really beautiful. Quite excited to yeah. listen to you talk about it. I want, the, well, the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, just how, how things have changed. You say you've been here 30 year, years odd, so that yeah. means you've seen that um, a lot of the techniques that Q uses like the, the, we didn't have long grass areas 30 years ago no exactly so, yeah. so what kind of natural more natural gardening has, has come to Q as a result of the changes in, in trends not just trends but also the, the challenges yeah so the, the biggest challenge I suppose at the moment is, is irrigation and what we water and how we water things so I mentioned that already that you know we're trying to group things better so we don't waste water there's more naturalistic planting there's more like you say long grass areas it's more a focus on, on wildlife um, and less of a focus on on systematic collections although they're still important people want to see a group of plants they can still see them they just might not be all in the same bed but then just have to walk around a bit yeah. you know yeah. and obviously technology's made a difference we've got much more advanced database than we used to have you know handheld um, computers that we can update the database while we're walking around rather than you know well, yeah. writing it down on a bit of paper um, social media is making a massive difference to horticulture. I mean, yeah, I follow people on Instagram who, um, you know, do vegetable gardening or kitchen gardening or different types of horticulture. And that it, it kind of the word spreads much more quickly yeah. these days. It needs to move. Things used to change much more slowly. But I think since the pandemic, been a big focus on growing your own food, hasn't there? Yeah, Not sure kitchen gardening is really. And I think a lot of that is down to social media kind of promoting it and people thinking, yeah. This and is it's a international as well. Do. So somebody can be on the other side of the planet and still be talking about yeah. what they're getting up to. Well, exactly. You can see it's worldwide. Exactly. And you don't have to go buy a book you could just listen to podcasts or, <laughs> yeah, or, or look things up on the internet yeah. so the in- everything's much more much quicker much into, more, more, we're, very, we're, we're, we're interconnected like we've never been before yeah absolutely and, and obviously one thing I remember because I remember uh, climbing on top of it is there's a big composting operation here yeah as well, yeah we, have, we do um, so all the mulch we use is made by us so we compost all our plant material and we wood chip you know trees if we have to or we reuse the wood um, get manure from the stables in horse guards parade because they're desperate to get rid of it so we get that we just pay for, for to have it delivered and we use that I and mean, that was the same in your day you know yeah. mix that with our own compost to make the mulch that we use so yeah there's a lot of recycling going on the other thing we've got to do is um to electric vehicles we're, we're starting to do that yeah, now as well good. yeah 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 um so not just our cars but all our equipment as well going over gradually to electric yeah so you know. all the right moves have been made yeah I, I, and also i suppose the long grass areas are my big memory because i worked in the arboretum yeah and they they must be really ecological rich i'd have thought oh, do you do studies yeah. on them i think i don't know uh, not myself but some people must be I mean, in Kew Science we'll, we'll be looking at different yeah. habitats and, and what grows there and how the biodiversity increases as you let things do their own thing as you just leave it leave yeah, it be yeah. almost and they just don't cut pop- it once a year and that's yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. it yeah. 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 yeah and you're not using petrol and machinery and stuff as much as well no exactly that, yeah yeah. it's much more it's much more much better for, for the environment doing it that way yeah. well we're going to have a quick look at the Alpine now, yeah of it course. looks amazing I know we're in an ecological garden and it is freezing <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so no, it's a bit cold <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that was really good. Thanks. Let's go and have a look at the uh, the Alpine House. Right, we're uh, by the amazing Alpine. An incredible structure, isn't it? That oh, it is. Yeah. So it's um, well, it's 17 years old. I can't believe it's so long. But yeah, 2006 it opened, but it's uh, designed by Wilkinson Air Architects, and it's an amazing structure. It's just, it's really tall, um, tall and narrow, isn't tall it? Tall and isn't narrow. It? And the reason for that is is what they call a the stack effect which is like a chimney the hot air leaves through the top the water draws in cooler air around the bottom so it's got open sides at the bottom and um, yeah it just keeps it cool because that's it's nice and cool in there for the alpine yeah yeah because the reason of having an alpine house is nothing to do with temperature we're not trying to keep them warm because they don't mind the cold at all but we're trying to keep them dry yeah that's that's a reason for the alpine house but as soon as you put a glass roof on anything it's going to get really hot so we, <laughs> so most of the technology is there to stop it getting overheating in the summer really so that's a, it's really heavily vented isn't it Heavily vented, they've got fans going inside to keep the air moving just to keep the temperatures down all the time. So 
yeah. they really are pampered plants. You know? Oh, they really yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not some pampered plants because these are really hardy. We're looking at what four sink gardens here. Yeah. Really beautiful old. Um, well, what stone are they made sinks. from? They are stone sinks. I mean, um, traditionally that's what you know, our pines were grown in, in these old stone sinks, which are not easy to get hold of these days. And most of these are normally donated to queue. People, you know, clear their gardens out and we get them from there. But sometimes some people make their own. It's called hypertufa. It's like crumbled up rock and cement and they can make a kind of... So you make a, like a shuttering for it. Yeah. You and can then uh, put a mix in. And yeah. Or then sometimes you get an old, you know, porcelain sink and then cover it in it so it so looks like of, stone. So like render it with cement. Yeah. And then yeah. You, I suppose then you could put a bit of um, bio on it, a bit of fer liquid fertiliser and some old yogurt. You might get, get some into some old and, up. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like these yeah. So yeah. you've got some with slate in as well so you can create a vertical Yeah, it's just different ways of, it's, you know, I've talked about drainage being really important. It's just different ways of, different ways of getting that drainage into a, a, a small space really so these slates are kind of vertical with little gaps between them where the plants are going out of that but their roots will, will you know the water won't collect there at all it will drain away really and the other rocks we see here these are a type of limestone called yeah. tufa. tufa um it's a naturally occurring um formed through from water going percolating through limestone rock and then it deposits um these these um tufa rocks which are very i don't know how to describe it like an arrow well, they're poor, bubbly porous, yeah. They? yeah they are so they're really they're bubbly yeah they're really porous so you can plant things actually in them mm. like we have a lovely talking about silver saxophone because these are some little silver leaves alpines you can plant them actually in the rock themselves in a hole and the roots can grow through the rock because it's got so many gaps in it and, um, and that's how you'd find them naturally i'll take and that's yeah. that's the closest we can get to a natural habitat really in in the garden it's, it looks, it's, looks incredible so to just describe it, you've got like a, a rock trough which you could make yourself with a bit of improvisation yeah this a, uh, rock that's called tufa tufa which is very porous yeah very porous and then and then uh, rosetted alpine saxifages and stuff planted into planted, that rock planted into the rock and the rocks are just sitting in a in the soil in the trough so it's a rectangular trough it's quite shallow you know maybe 20 centimeters deep inside free draining soil in there and then you put the rocks in there kind of half bury them so they're sticking out at the top and then you can plant things directly into them it looks incredible and you've got so that would be 30 70 gravel and loam as a substrate as a, yeah, yeah 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 and then you've top dressed them off with with more gravel bit of, bit of yeah. gravel on the top just to, it looks nice apart from anything else but also yeah it keeps the moisture away from the leaves of the plants as well it, they look fantastic and even the dead of winter Winter where I was going to say it's not the best time of year to see them, but <laughs> yeah, even now, not, even now, the form of those yeah, plants is really beautiful. Just, they look amazing. They you really know, and do. you come back in in you know two or three months time, and they'll be full of flowers. Just want to thank you, Richard, or Wilf, as I know you. That's all right. For this little chat, I really, no really appreciate nice it. To see you again. And I look forward to your carbon garden. Yes, yeah, yeah. Come back in a couple of years yeah. if you got a spare million. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for the post bag. Emma's kindly stayed on the line to help you with your questions, and we're joined by Anton Rosenfeld. Hi, Anton. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. The first one I can sympathise with. This email has come from Vivian, who asks how we can stop a fox from <coughs> digging up her garden lawn. She's managed to live with the mess through the winter, but doesn't want it any longer. So, Emma, have you had any trouble with foxes at Wrighton? Fortunately, I haven't uh, had problems with them at Wrighton. But I think one of the things really is about having a look at the access to your garden. They will readily kind of burrow under fences, any little holes they'll get to. And once you've got them, I hate to say it, but they are return visitors. And they'll be looking in the lawn for all the bugs, really, the worms and the grubs, um, especially if there's a shortage of food around. That's what I do primarily. Check all your perimeter, your boundaries, block up any holes that are necessary. Have a look at, you know, if there's a particular patch that they're continually going for. Really, if there's any other preventative methods. Anton, have you got any suggestions? Yeah, quite often there's something in particular that might be attracting them into the gardens. Perhaps check your compost heap, check there's no cooked food or anything on your compost heap. You might have to make your compost a little bit more secure as well. You can get quite secure compost bins, which are sort of fully enclosed as well. Um, so just anything that might be bringing them in. Also, certain fertilizers as well, like sort of blood and bone meal, they really make a beeline for. So try try to avoid using those. Are there any traditional methods of getting rid of foxes, Santon? Well, there's quite a lot of things which are sort of down through various sort of gardening chat forums and books and sort of conversations on allotments. I mean, one of the common ones is um, 
is getting people to pee on things that they say that fox really dislikes the smell of male urine i i really don't know whether that's true or not <laughs> just don't get arrested while you're doing it would be my advice for that <laughs> and then there's a range of obviously people always capitalize on these things and try and sell you stuff so sort of various potions and um sonic deterrents and things from what i've heard they're not that effective um i i certainly haven't seen the sort of evidence that they work because like emma says foxes tend to be pretty determined once they once they decide they're going to come to a place they don't like people very much as well so if you can actually sort of encounter one of them and shout at it and perhaps use a water pistol or something just to <laughs> scare it off i think yeah i think better. it's about making your space less friendly isn't it and exactly. keeping things like your waist well out of the way and secured but uh yeah you need to try some shock Shock tactics, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping up and down in the garden, that's what I'd do. Yeah, that, that sounds like fun to me. Uh, also, you know, March is a good time re for repairing lawns, so hopefully you get rid of your fox or at least it doesn't come as often, but you could also do any repairs that the, the, the to the damage that the fox has done. I would personally, we used to get this trouble with bowling greens, but with squirrels instead of foxes, we just do a little top dress mix, a little bit of loam, some round washed sand, fill it with seed, go along, spread it with a shovel on the holes and the damage, and then smooth it in with the back of a rake. That will germinate in no time. So hopefully you can get ahead of the fox and have a decent lawn this summer, Vivian. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Jenny has contacted us with a composting query. She says, we submerge our perennial weeds underwater in a wheelie bin for at least two months until they turn to a sludge. This is then added to our compost bin and the liquid is used as a fertiliser. Jenny would like to know if the seed heads will die by this method. Anton, what do you think? I think it's... Pretty unlikely that, that that drowning them will actually kill off the actual seed heads. It will do a good job of sort of rotting away at all the roots and things, but the actual seed heads themselves, I think, are very likely to survive being drowned in in water. The ideal thing is to avoid putting the seed heads in in the first place. I actually think that's less work. But the other thing you could do is just try and get your compost really, really hot. So you could do that by chopping everything up really, really small. You have to be quite meticulous about it and then turning it really, really regularly once every couple of days or so. And that will really get your compost hot. To be honest, I think that's a lot more work than actually just avoiding putting your seed heads in into your compost being a little bit more vigilant in the first place makes your job easier <clears throat> emma what do you reckon well obviously i'm in a fortunate position that i have staff and volunteers managing our garden all the time so we very rarely have anything actually going to seed if we do though we tend to desiccate ours by drying them out so that's either we have an old pallet outside where we would put them once we dug them up if it was perennial weeds and we'd leave them until they were completely sort of like almost like dust really if it was actually in the ground we tend to hoe them off and then leave them in the sun for the sun and the wind to break them down but as you say we also manage what we consider a hot composting system because we're turning our compost heap so frequently and adding stuff so constantly that we don't tend to get that much of an issue the only thing I tend to get really is occasionally we'll get some annual weed seeds but of course if you get them quick enough you're knocking them off before they tend to go to seed so if you didn't have the time or the staff and uh, you're out working all day and you had a pernicious weed problem you think uh that maybe hot composting is the solution anton yeah it could be as long as you do need to put the effort in to get it up to temperature um the the danger is you may have still have some cool spots within it that don't get quite hot enough but hopefully it should kill off most most of the weed seed heads i must admit i find tomatoes are the main problem in my <laughs> In my <laughs> compost, I get loads of tomato seedlings coming up, but, but they're fairly easy to get rid of. Well, all I can think of to say to this is, uh, is what, what I say when I go into schools, really, and I always say to them, weed before they seed. So if you stop them seeding, then that cuts down the problem. But I appreciate not everybody has the time. So I'll go on to the third question, our final question. Our final question is from a member who recently moved house. She says she has found the soil around the house is shallow loam over rock. She's planned a vegetable garden and an herbaceous border, but is worried she won't be able to grow anything. She'd like some advice on 
ways she can improve her soil in the short and long term and what she could plant and what will flourish in these soil conditions. Anton, you can say a little bit about soils for us. Yeah, I think this is a really, really common problem, especially people perhaps moving into a new build house as well, where the builder just dumps all their rubble and then puts a sort of quarter inch layer of topsoil over the over the top so really you want to do as much as possible a to improve the soil you've got if she's got a sandy loam then she really wants to get that organic matter in there because that sandy loam is just going to lose water and nutrients so quickly it's that your plants are going to dry out so the the compost and the organic matter that it provides will behave like a sponge and sort of soak up water and nutrients and help it retaining them much better. So if you're going to do that on a larger scale, I would even try and get a delivery of green waste compost to, um, you want to try and get something that's certified as past 100 and um, spread it on your garden. And that will help to improve, that will improve it sort of longer term. It won't apply if so, sort of quick fix of nutrients but it'll improve the health of your soil in the long term as a quicker fix you might even want to put in some raised beds as well with some topsoil if you want to be growing veg but um it it depends what you want to do really what about actual crops you'd grow do you have any ideas emma anything really that has got shallow roots and that are pretty quick i would start off initially so things like all the salad sort of crops, spring onions, red radish, things like that. But um, once you've hopefully improved the soil, then you could move on and try other things. But you really need to just be going with things that you know aren't going to be have to be in the ground that long, so won't get starved of nutrients. And as Anton says, the main key really is the soil health. It's improving the soil nutrient quantity and the structure to it. You have a lot of uh, raised beds at right in them. Uh, how do you treat those? How do you look after those? Because you grow herbs and things like that, don't you? Yeah, so really, once once we'd actually filled them with the right sort of consistency of soil, we tend to leave them. We might do what the same as you do with the container gardens, sort of take off the top layer and improve it every year. But we also find that one of the issues I have with raised beds is that you do tend to have to feed them more regularly. So we tend to treat it as a bit more like a container garden. So long term, you're looking at, adding as much compost and soil to it as possible to improve yeah. that soil. If you, if she's a little bit un- less patient, let's say, she can put some raised beds in. She also mentions ornamental. She obviously likes her flowers, her basis border. Probably a bit too shallow for her basis plants, do you think, Emma? Yeah, unless you go for Mediterranean, really. Yeah. So you could go for Mediterranean plants. I think, realistically, you're better to try to improve your soil if you're looking for a wide range of herbaceous. Yeah, it sounds about right. I think that if you uh, wanted a little bit of colour straight away, I think I'd go for a rock garden. That's what I saw when I thought, when I looked at it, I thought a rock garden would mm. probably work there. Maybe some more breccia, some campanula, some cerium, alisum. These are all kind of easy to grow. You see them in the tops of walls and stuff. They don't need a lot of yeah. soil. Even some bulbs, scylla, grape hyacinth, that kind of thing. Even a noreen, one of Lawrence Hill's favourites, a little noreen for your rock garden. But um, in the long term, it's all about soil improvement. Well, thank you to you both. That was great. I'm sure there's uh, um, some answers for our queries in there. And uh, thanks a lot. See you next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this month. And I hope we've left you feeling inspired to get out into that garden and kick off the new growing season with Ernest. Thanks so much to Richard Wilford for speaking to me on this week's episode. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music. 